Uh, it's about the blind man. We talked about the blind man uh, in that song, the very first song we did. Just like the blind man, I wandered along. And I want to talk about the story where Jesus, where he heals that guy, where he uh, makes the lights come on for him, where he heals him from blindness. Blindness in the, in the New Testament with Jesus, and, and in the Old Testament too, often used as a metaphor for, uh, for spiritual blindness too. The physical blindness is a metaphor for the spiritual blindness and how you couldn't see all the things that God was doing. And Jesus in particular uh, makes a lot of use out of that, 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 that idea. And a lot of the people that he heals, are, he heals the blind frequently and, and, and talks about it when he's doing it, but, but not any time more than in John 9. So I wanted to kind of focus on that. And just as a history kind of thing, uh, when all this is happening in John 9, actually John uh, 7, 8, 9, and the first part of 10 is all happening during the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, which may not mean a lot to you. I had to make sure I was right on my facts. I studied on this a little bit this week. So if you're not really familiar with the feast days, uh, that, that's okay. Don't feel bad about that. But, uh, but just, to, just for history, so you know about it, there were three big feasts in Jewish uh, thinking. There was the Passover, where they remembered coming out of Egypt. And there was the Feast of Weeks, which was 50 days uh, later, um, at Pentecost, and they would remember the, uh, getting the, the covenant, uh, the Ten Commandments. And so uh, during those two feasts, during Passover, the first one there, and then and, 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 uh, early summer there and at Feast of Weeks, uh, pretty serious religious overtones for those. And they would really focus in hard on the, a lot of times in the Feast of Weeks, uh, all-night Torah study sessions. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, during Passover, a lot of blood sacrifices going on. It was, it was, it was, a, it was supposed to be a feast, so like t- t- fun things are happening too. But it was pretty serious, the, the, the root behind all of it. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, that came in the fall. And uh, though the root underneath of it still uh, kind of serious, you're trying to remember when Jesus, when God, excuse me, when God brought them across the, the desert and they had to live in temporary tents and shelters. So the, 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 the root still, but it had a whole different feel than the other two. Uh, and, and, and we see that pretty early, and we see that in, in biblical stuff, but, but, but more so in extra-biblical stuff, that it became kind of a fall festival, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was at the end of the year, and you were given a lot of thanks for what God had done through the year. I grew up in a farming family. I know some of you, you did too, and, and everybody's in a good mood in a farming family in the fall. All the money's coming in in the fall. Money's going out in the spring. Everybody's kind of ticked off, worried mood. Money's coming in in the fall. And so it, 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 kind of because of that, it, it always was, it seems like it was a crowded festival. And maybe there's some indication, maybe even more crowded than the other two. People would really pack in for this festival. And every day they would try to remember how God poured his blessing onto the people. There was a prophet named Ezekiel who said that water was going to flow out of the, the temple and create, turn the desert into a green valley. And so they, they would go down to the, the Gihon Spring, uh, which flowed into the Pool of Siloam. And they would go down every day to the Pool of Siloam and get this golden pitcher full of water. And they would take it to the altar and they would pour it on the altar and the water would stream out of it. And in John 7, when Jesus starts his tabernacle stuff. He, he talks about he's like that. He compares himself to that scene, like water will flow out of anybody, like streams of living water will flow out. The spirit will move in somebody who's with me. And then there's an awful moment where uh, a woman's caught in adultery and taken to Jesus in John 8. And he says, uh, uh, whoever has no sin can throw the first stone and turns it all on its head. And then teaches this long section about how he is light and, and how he's come to shine a new light on things. And all this is happening during this gigantic feast. And, and people are in a pretty good mood and, and, and pretty festive. And, 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 they're, and, 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 and Jesus is pretty popular during all this thing. And he's causing a lot of attention. But his popularity is kind of freaking out the, the leaders of the, the Jewish faith because they're afraid that he's taking people the wrong direction. So all that's happening in the background. And Jesus is walking through town during the festival and he sees a guy. And that's how the story starts. He just sees a guy, and it's a man who was born blind uh, from birth. And the disciples ask Jesus, who sinned, teacher? Was it this guy or his parents that he was born blind? And um, and we don't know how the disciples know he's born blind. I kind of think probably the guy had 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 a sign of some sort. You'll see people do that sometimes when they're begging. They'll have a sign up saying that they're a a veteran or that they, their family's, you know, in trouble or something's going on, need surgery. Or, and, you, and the sign reminds you of the awful thing going on. And I'm, maybe this guy had a sign that he was born blind and somebody had helped him make that and he used it to get people to pay attention to him. Because if you were blind in that day, I mean, you were going to be pretty poor. You're going to be dependent upon the kindness of strangers. And Jesus sees this guy. Now, the disciples don't totally see him. They kind of see him, but not, not really. Um, Chuck Smith, when he 
taught this passage. I, I found a quote from him. He, he said, when an accident happens, the police get there and the paramedics. And the police are interested in figuring out whose fault it is. They secure the situation, you know, secure the crime scene, measure the skid marks, or look at the broken door and try to figure out who started it, who's to blame, who's, who did what to who. The paramedics get there. They're not concerned about any of those things. They just want to help the people who are hurt. And Jesus comes, and, and, uh, and he doesn't care about that stuff. He just wants to help the guy. But the disciples care about it, or they say they do. Who sinned, teacher, they said. You know, who's, who's the, the problem here? Is it this guy or his parents? Because the thinking is, if, if you're having trouble, you, somebody, you probably did something to deserve it. And if this guy had trouble from birth, then maybe something happened. Maybe he did something, or God knew he was going to do And you know, when you say things like that, you're automatically, just by having the question, putting yourself in a good box. Like you are in your good area, and you can look down on the bad people. Say, how did the bad people get treated so bad? They must have sinned something pretty bad, not like we good people do. And you'll see Christians do that sometimes. It's always awful, and you should condemn it pretty hard whenever you see that happen. But uh, some, some, uh, when AIDS came out, a lot of people say, well, it's just because they're such awful sinners. And if awful sinners got disease, it's a wonder any of us made it here this morning. And, I, and I've never understood all of the logic that makes people say some of the things that they that they say, and, um, and that's what the disciples are doing. We're, we're good guys, look at this, and, and then probably having the conversation right there with them, right, because Jesus is going to immediately do something about the guy. It's possible he's even hearing them talk about him, but he can't really get away. He's just got to put up with it, but Jesus, right, he's a paramedic. He's a, he's a good physician. He wants to help the guy, and so Jesus says, well, it's not, this, it's not about sin, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so the work of God can be displayed in him. And you could read this like Jesus is saying, God struck him with blindness so that we could see this awful th- we could see the cure. And I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I, I think he's saying, this is an opportunity for us to do something good. You know, you're worrying about how it all got started and what's the cause, but here's an opportunity for us to speak into this man's life to make a difference. You know, we're here at this point right now to help this fellow. He says, and he goes on with that. He says, as long as it's day, we've got to do the work of him who sent me. And, and that scent is a big deal in this chapter. It'll come up again later. We've got to do the work of him who sent me. Night's coming, he says, when no one can work. And while I'm here, I'm the light of the world. Jesus says, while I'm here, I'm going to do good things. And that's our marching orders too. We're the light of the world in the same way that he is. We're things we're supposed to be doing just like he's doing things. And so it says, after saying that, he spits on the ground and he makes some mud and he puts it on the guy's eyes, which admittedly in 2023 post-COVID seems a little gross, but, 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 it, but, it, but it wouldn't have been necessarily seen that way. Mud's always been a little shady as far as seeing gross, but it probably wouldn't have been seen totally that way. I mean, God made something out of the mud of the, the dirt of the ground. So there's a little bit of a creation element here going on that Jesus is going to make new life happen. And, and, and in that day, uh, to put some spit on it, that wasn't necessarily the worst thing in the world. My mother used to do that, just, you know, rake things, you know, and it would, wasn't seen as the worst thing, you know, you know, oh, gross, mom, it wasn't, wasn't that kind of thing. You might try to get away from her, but it wasn't like you were. So anyway, he does that, makes the, makes the mud, puts it on his eyes, and, and, and he says, go to the Pool of Siloam. Now, remember, the Pool of Siloam is where they do their festival every day. It's like they go there, get the water out of that. That's the water of God's blessing, and then pour it on the altar. Go to the pool of Siloam, he says, and, and, and the word Siloam means sent, which kind of recalls what, you know, I've been sent to do good work, and I'm sending you now, he says. And so the man went, and he washed, and he came home seeing. And there's even a little bit of a baptism reference here, you know. I mean, he, he, he t- goes under the water, and he comes up a new guy. Well, the Pharisees, uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of the Pharisees are a little against this because the day that Jesus did this thing was a Sabbath, and they're a little mad about it, and they say, well, hey, wait a minute. This man's not from God. He's doing stuff on the sea. It's not keeping the Sabbath. But then other Pharisees say, well, wait a minute. Look at the good stuff he's doing. Sinners can't do stuff like that, and they're divided. And so they bring the guy in. They brought the blind man in. They said, what do you say about him? Is your eyes he opened? And the man said, well, I think he's a prophet. I mean, in all other words, somebody do something like that, I mean, I think we can safely say that maybe, maybe he's, a, he's a good guy. You know, he's the kind of guy we should listen to. Well, so now the Pharisees start wondering, well, maybe it was a trick. So they, they bring the guy's parents in. They say, is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it he can see now? In other words, maybe Jesus pulled a fast one. And, and so you got this guy who's been out there begging all this time. Maybe this isn't even the right guy. We thought it was the same guy who's been begging, but that's a whole other guy. 
and maybe, or maybe he wasn't really born blind. It's been a con all this time. And so they bring the guy's parents in, and they want to figure it out. And the parents say, listen, we know it's our son, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. You can ask him. He's of age, and he can speak for himself. In other words, the parents want nothing to do with this. And, and John tells us, he says, parents said that because they were, they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Because the Jewish leaders said, anybody who acknowledges Jesus as Messiah, we put out of the synagogue. Now, in our day, that, that, that kind of a threat wouldn't have near the weight that it would then. But, but in that day, where there's just one synagogue, really, in town, and, and, uh, and, and this is where everybody goes. This is where all of our friends are. This is, this is our whole social connection, and this is our social safety net, too. There was no Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. If you ran into trouble, you went to the synagogue, and they would help you out. And so to get kicked out of that, it's a big, 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 big deal. And the parents are scared of it. And so they're not really going to help their son on this thing. They're going to let the son deal with it himself. Which may tell you something about the relationship between the parents. And maybe the parents were just cowards. It might, might not tell you something. But, but it may tell you something. You know, if you have a kid who's born blind, then you know immediately this kid's never going to do all the things that maybe you hoped he would. He's just going to require constant care. And maybe the parents had kind of turned on him somewhere. They aren't that close anyway. Yeah, that's our son, but we don't want any part of this. And, and um, there's a whole other sermon I could do, actually. And I'm not going to do two sermons today. But there's a whole other sermon I could do where, where this guy's life is getting more complicated because he's with Jesus. And I think that's interesting. I... I before, he's kind of invisible. I mean, Jesus sees him, but people aren't even sure if it's the same guy, right? And now he's got no end of trouble. And I think that happens sometimes. I used to get mad at church camps and, and uh, youth uh, big outreaches or whatever when I was a youth minister when they would give the implication that you become a Christian and solve all your problems. And I don't know if that works. It certainly solves a few problems, but it can create others. And, and sometimes... People are stunned by, you know, at some level, if, if all the things we talk about are true, if there really is a devil, if there really is a spiritual war going on, then when you identify and say, I'm going to be a Christian, you should expect some resistance. You should expect a little bit of conflict. And I think people are always kind of stunned by this thing. Uh, you go to a, a big ball game, you know, where they have ramps to get everybody out. Like I use a basketball or football, and there's big ramps on the side of the stadium or in the, in the field house there where you're, everybody's in this huge line, and you're walking down. And as you're walking out of the game, game's over, you realize, oh, I left my jacket on the, the chair. Oh, I left my backpack back. I need to go. So you turn around, and you're trying to force yourself through there, and you're just getting hit all the time. And you're not trying to hit anybody. You're trying to make yourself as small as you can as you go through. But it's just everybody's in a hurry to go that direction and you're heading the other way and you're going to get knocked around some. And I think sometimes people get surprised by that when they first become a Christian. I had no idea this was going to happen. But I think it's to be expected. Ben Stewart is a minister in, a, in, a, in Washington, D.C. and he talks about uh, in, a, in a big battle, there's two kinds of soldiers. Some soldiers look completely at peace and other soldiers look terrified. The soldiers that look terrified are alive. <laughs> the ones who look at peace are dead. It's easy to be at peace when nothing else is going to happen wrong. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes when you're spiritually dead, a lot of the conflict of being, it all escapes you. You're not concerned about any of those things. You're not concerned about Jesus. And you're certainly not concerned about defending Jesus or any of his positions or any of his ideas. And then you, you make that decision. And all of a sudden, there's this whole world of problems. And we don't talk about that enough. And like I said, there's a whole other sermon there I could do. Maybe I'll do it uh, for too long. But there's a whole other thought there that's, that's worth thinking about because uh, this guy's really having some trouble. And so they come to him again. And these are the guys who can make his life miserable. And they call him in again. They say, hey, give glory to God. You know, just tell the truth. We know this man. We know Jesus is a sinner. So, so in other words, tell us you really weren't blind or tell us, he, you know, some sort of a trick let us know what's going on. Give glory to God. They say, you know, this is your last chance. Tell us what. Well, it makes him, it makes him a little frustrated. And he says, he says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. 
Now, this verse here could, should, should be a memory verse for you if you're, serious about, if you're serious about sharing your faith because it really simplifies things. Uh, when I, before I was a Christian, I was scared of everything. I, I was constantly nervous about my, my position and my place. I, I had a hard time dealing with people, and I was kind of an introvert, almost to the point of a hermit, hiding behind telling jokes and, and being funny, but trying to be as invisible as I could be all the time. And when Jesus got a hold of me, it changed everything. Now, I still struggle with some of that stuff. I don't pretend like that's all a a feature of my past, but it opened my heart, it opened my eyes in a way that I never had before, and it took away a lot of the fear and the anxiety because I knew that God cared about me. And so if someone comes to me and I'm trying to witness to them and talk to them, and they want to talk about Noah's Ark or the dinosaurs, I don't know about a lot of that stuff, and I'll do the best I can, but about dinosaurs, I can't give you a great answer maybe. But here's what I do know, Jesus changed my life. I mean, I was this kind of guy, and now I'm this kind of guy, and it's all Jesus. Well, I want to talk about free will. Well, okay, let's talk about it, but I don't know if I can answer all your questions there, but I can tell you for sure about Jesus and what he did. This is what Jesus did for me, and that's what the blind man does. I said, I don't know about all the stuff about Jesus. I just met him a few minutes ago, but but I can tell you this, that guy's got some power, and he. He's changed my life. Well, they asked him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And, and he says, I've told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And at some level, it's real sarcastic. And he, and he probably is aware he's being sarcastic. He's getting ticked off, and so he's, he's pushing back a little bit. But when he says disciples too, he's kind of implying, well, I'm, more, I'm going to follow the dude. I don't know about Jesus, but here's a guy who made, he's made my whole life different. I'm going to see what he has to say. And this ticks them off too. They say, well, you're his disciple. Sure, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but for this guy, we don't even know where he comes from. And, and, and he said, well, that's pretty incredible. That's pretty remarkable, he says. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. In other words, the guy's saying, I don't care where he comes from. This, this again goes back to that, I don't want to debate about some finer point of, you know, small whatever. I mean, here's what I know. He changed me. And it's not that the other stuff doesn't matter, but we've got all day long to talk about the other stuff. I mean, the, 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 to this guy, the key is, man, here's a man with power. And he goes on to explain it. He says, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners, and yet... He does what's a godly person and does, who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of somebody healing the eyes of a man born blind. If this man wasn't from God, he couldn't do anything. No one's ever heard of somebody healing the eyes of a man born, born blind. You, you know, when I, a, a year and a, a half ago, I had to have eye surgery, and it was pretty risky surgery. They told me the risks of bad things happening was kind of significant, and they they. They explained all that to me, and, and we went through the surgery. It came through pretty good, and, and at first my eyes were really blurry. You know, it took a long time to really get it back. But, but before too long, I was able to see, you know, pretty good, and, and things were coming back more and more and more. And I remember talking to the doctor at my six-week appointment, you know, after where I said, I say, when will we get back to normal? And he says, let me tell you about your new normal, he says. And he says, you're, you're never going to get back to what you had before. And so here in 2023, with all the doctors, with all the medicine, all the progress we have, blindness is tough. I mean, there's things the doctors can do, there's things the doctors can figure out, but your eye is still a very sensitive organ, and, and it's, just, it's, it's, it's just not much you can do. And even today, I don't know that we can heal a person born blind. Maybe there's some science that can get that done, a transplant or something that we can do now that they couldn't have then. But it, it, as a miracle goes, it's a staggering thing. No one's ever heard of something like this. I mean, in any other way, in any other situation, you'd be wanting to follow this guy. That's what the blind man's saying. And, and yet you're not even opening up yourself at all to consider it. Well, he, and he, he, so he's taunting them with this whole paragraph behind me. And, and, uh, and that just ticks them off. And they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they tossed him out. And they, and they probably threw him out of the synagogue. Probably didn't just throw him out of their meeting. Probably he's kicked. Probably what the parents were afraid of happening is what happens to this guy. He's probably kicked out of the synagogue. So he's really losing a lot. As literature goes, just as a story, not even a spiritual thing, just as a, a narrative goes, uh, the story ends the same way it started. At the very beginning of it, the disciples are saying, is this guy born into sin? Did he sin at birth? Is that what happened? 
And now here at the end of the story, the Pharisees are saying, yeah, you're steeped in sin at birth. Get out of here. At the beginning of the story, the man's kind of invisible to most people. And at the end of the story, there are some people who want to make him invisible again. They don't, they don't want to deal with him. As literature, it's really cool how John how he frames it all. Well, Jesus finds him afterward and introduces himself to him. And, and this man worships Jesus and tends to follow Jesus. And Jesus says this thing at the very end of the chapter. He says, for judgment, I've come into the world. So that the blind can see and those who, who can see will become blind. And, and uh, the Pharisees hear Jesus talking about this thing. And they say, you think we're blind? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But because you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Now again, Jesus uses language like this several different places. And I know it can seem kind of murky what he's trying to say. But because you claim you understand everything, because you claim you can see you're going to be in trouble, he says. Remember on the cross, when Jesus is on the cross, he, he prays. While he's on the cross to, to God, he says, Father, Father, forgive them. Remember that? He says, God, Father, forgive them because they, remember, they don't know, they don't know what they're doing. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. They, they, they can't see. But these Pharisees, they say they can see. And so, and so it's a different animal here, Right? You're going to bounce into people all the time. And, uh, and some of them will want to talk to you about this stuff, and some of them won't. And some of them will be real interested, and some people won't. And you'll have to let God sort that out. Uh, our job is just to let them know. I guess the biggest danger of that last verse would be a person who, who knows they need to get right with God, and they don't. They know they need to get themselves figured out, and they just keep putting it off for whatever reason. We'll talk more about that in a second, maybe. Philip Reef is a uh, historian, a sociologist, uh, like he writes about this stuff and, and how we organize ourselves. And he, he talks about this notion of a post-Christian culture, and, uh, a, a pre-Christian culture before Jesus comes in. So you think the, uh, the Vikings or the Native American tribes or uh, Celtic Druids or something like that. And there's no, Jesus isn't part of the conversation at all. And then Jesus comes into the conversation. And, and you see these cultures change. The, the pre-Christian culture gives way to the Christian culture. And it adopts a lot of Christian thinking. And, and, it, and it's, it's, it's intense, really, if you study this thing, how much Christian thinking has bled into everything. You'll see people on two sides of the same, like abortion is an issue. You'll see people saying on one side of the issue, we've got to care about the life of the unborn, which is a distinctly Christian position, Right? As Christians, we have to hold to that, man, and we, get, we care about life. But then you see the other side say, no, 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 we got to care about the life of the mother. we got to care about her body. Her body, it's her body, her body, her choice. She controls her body, which is interesting because nobody in the ancient world felt like that. Caesar didn't feel that way. Zeus wouldn't have taught that. Uh, Socrates wouldn't have thought that. Nobody in the ancient world thought a woman's body was her own. Nobody in the ancient world thought that, that, that you could control your body if you were lower class to somebody else. Everybody assumed the stronger person dictated to the, to the weaker. It's only Jesus that speaks up as a voice that changes everything. And so, and so in the Christian culture, we start adopting certain ways of thinking because Jesus taught it. And even if you're not a Christian, you can't escape that. It, it's a, all men are created equal is a Christian idea. It's not, a, it's not a verse of Scripture, but it's, a, it's an idea that comes from Jesus. It's an idea that is grounded in Him. And we've never been a Christian nation in the sense that everybody was Christian. I'm not impl implying that. But, but this, this, this notion that there were certain foundational rules that we all did together, well, that was, was how we did. But this guy, Reeve, Philip Reeve, he says we're in a post-Christian culture. And so people don't want to accept that Jesus is behind any of it. But what's weird is they don't go back to living like Vikings. We don't go back to living like the early Romans. We don't go back to that. We want to keep the, the, the institution, the rules, how you know, take care of the victim, take care of the weak, take care. But we don't want Jesus to be part of it. And uh, 
uh, John Mark Comer has a book where he talks about this. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a 20-year-old who's still living at his parents' house. He hates the rules, but he likes eating their food. It's that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and so as a culture, they, they, they like the, the, the rules of it. You know, all men are created equal. Oh, that's a good one. But, but they have none of the, the grace or the compassion or the love behind it. They don't accept Jesus. So what do you get? Well, you get riots. You get people protesting how they're not getting treated fair and, and, and riots, and the riots are violent and the riots are mean because Christ isn't part of any of that stuff. You, you, get, you get diversity and equality and inclusion stuff with no compassion. You just grind people up about rules. You, you get, you get uh, 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 people who, who on purpose uh, walk away from all of the, the love and the joy and the peace and the purpose, and, 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 and they, they claim to be a victim or they claim to be uh, attacked by some greater power above them, but there's no, there's no Jesus in any of it. It's all the things that Jesus would have talked about with none of his power to it. It's a weird time. And how we evangelize in this era is, is different maybe than in other eras. In other eras, you could challenge people to get their life in order, right? Maybe. You could challenge people to get to church. That's where all the good people are at. Go to church and be with the good people. You could challenge them on that. But I don't know that any of those things work in a post-Christian culture. I think the thing that they're missing is Jesus. It, it's, it's real simple. But that's what they're missing. That's what they need to know. And so we need to tell them. They're blind. I, 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 tr truthfully, I can't watch the news or look at my, my computer screen and read about the news, or read the newspaper, or I, 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 can't, I can't read about any current events without having that thought. People don't even know. And, and it's the same prayer, I guess, that Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them, they don't, they don't know, but they're, they're blind. And, and, and we do know. And we do know. But too many of us are scared to say anything. We're afraid if we toss something out, it's, it's going to affect a friendship or it's going to make people look at us weird or, or we're going to be seen as a fanatic or somebody that can't be trusted for the real world. We'll be left out of all the best parties. When I first became a Christian, I remember that being kind of a frightening prospect to me because, like I said, I had always struggled with that, wondering where my place was and everything. I, I mean, I was worried about it. And I remember being worried about that. God, if I do this, what will happen to me, and, and how will I get it? And when I first became a Christian, I sure tried to share my faith, and I found out that the more I did it, the more it put walls up between me and a few people. Not everybody appreciated me wanting to speak into these things, and I remember that being real lonely sometimes. But I think I've made peace with it by now. I think I understand that if I'm going to speak up for God, and if I'm going to go the wrong way on the ramp, right? Everybody's heading this way, and I'm trying to go the other direction. I'm going to bump into people sometimes. And I may not get invited to the best parties. I, uh, and that's okay. I remember being, <laughs> Julie and I got invited to a Halloween party in California and it was, it was a good party. It was the kind of party preachers don't normally get invited to. And, and, uh, and, and we, we were supposed to come in costume. And uh, Julie and I came in costume, and nobody knew who we were. The host didn't know who we were. And uh, we didn't do anything stupid. That would be a better story probably. We didn't do anything stupid. But, but it was such a... Um, an interesting deal to, to just blend in, and, it, and, I, and I get it feels good. It feels good to just blend in, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to anybody who wants to do it, <laughs> but that's not what we're called to. Jesus says you're the light of the world. A city on a hill can't uh, be hidden, and you shouldn't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but instead you put it on a stand, it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, he says, you should let your light shine before men that they can see your good deeds and give glory to God in heaven. You're the light of the world. We've got this stand in the back of the room, and it says everyone on it because the gospel's for everyone. And we ask people, we've asked for the last uh, four weeks, if, if, if you will share your faith with somebody, or if you've done it this week, if you shared your faith or shared your story, had a spiritual conversation with somebody and you've never done that before, or invited someone to church, go light up a light. 
Just turn it a little half a turn to the, to the right there, and it'll light up. Because we're the light of the world, and it's our job to make sure people know about this thing. We need to tell them. It's been encouraging when I preach to look back and see that people are doing some of that. And, and maybe there's one or two of you that have done some of that the last week or two, and you've not turned the bulb yet, and I just encourage you to do it. Maybe something silly like that will kind of prompt you to say, well, I don't want to be the only one here who's not taking this thing seriously. I want to be somebody who cares about this stuff too. It's just so critically crazy important. You know, I've talked to parents who are scared to talk about this to their teenage and 20-year-old kids. And it's not like they talk about it all the time. Like, you know, my kids are sick of hearing me. You, they never talk about it. I know people who, who have been friends with somebody for decades, and they just never talk about this stuff. It's just it's just understood that this is a part of my life that's mine, and I don't share it with anybody. And I think you'll regret that one day, and I know they'll regret that one day. And we've, we've just got an obligation to say something. And it does make your life more complicated. And it's expensive. If you're an introvert, uh, it's going to cost you some of your time and energy. It's going to cost you some of your money. If there's a way to love cheap, let me know what that is because I've not figured it out yet. If there's a way to love cheap, uh, tell me how to do that, and I'll do it. I don't think it works. I think we're called to be light in God's world and to shine, that people need it because they're walking in darkness. They're blind. And we can help them out. So at the end of the service, I'm going to ask for two things. First of all, like we always do, if you're somebody who your own self needs to get straight with God, well, then take advantage of this time. You know, we'll have people up here and we'll pray. The song that we're going to sing, the first song is very much a song about calling out to God, God, come grab me. And if that's how you feel, then, then, man, take advantage of this time. Seriously, call out to God and, and ask him to move in your life. And if you're a Christian and you're kind of coasting, you know, it's not real to you and you want that, to call out to God. I think God always answers that kind of prayer. But then second, I want to pray for anybody in here who, who has a friend or two who they need to say something to. If a, if a friend or two, if a face or two or a name or two popped into your head, I want to pray about that. And I want to pray for you to have the courage to, to jump in there, to see the opportunity, so just bring it up and see what God will do. Because God, God can move in pretty quiet things if you'll give him a chance. So I want to pray about both those things, and then we'll, we'll close. So pray with me. Dear Lord God, I, I thank you for this group, and I do pray, God, for, for anybody out here who has someone else on their heart, for anybody out here, God, who knows someone who needs to hear and I pray, God, uh, that you give them the, the courage to bring it up, to speak, to, to, to introduce you to the other person. I pray also, God, if there's anybody here who, uh, uh, who needs to get their own eyes opened, to really gaze hard at Jesus, to, to make some adjustments, I pray, God, you give them this courage and the strength to, to meet you here. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you all stand?